Hello, you're welcome to the Voters Diary. My name is Vivian Kai Loko. In a bit, I'll introduce to you what we'll be doing today, and we'll be right back. Yeah, welcome back to the Voters Diary and our conversation on health continues today. We're looking at the policies by the two major political parties, looking at infrastructure, access to health care, cost of health care, employment incentives, and what have you. And today I'll be having the discussion with two gentlemen. Kojo Akoto Boating heads our new media team here at City FM and City TV. He'll be joining us today. Kojo, welcome. Thank you, Vivian. And then I also have Seloma Dunu, head of features and articles here at City FM and City TV. Salam, welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, so gentlemen, yesterday we started um, um, primary, free primary health care to everybody based on what the NDC is saying. I think we'll just wrap up with that and look at, uh, in terms of health care, access to health care, what the MPP is proposing, if any, in its uh, uh, manifesto, and then we, we'll look at other issues. So if we can, Salam, well, what, what are we seeing in terms of the two and the MPP in particular? Well, um, so, so the MPP, I mean, they, they are in government, so uh, a lot of their things really uh, <clears throat> have been, of course, when you look at their manifesto, they, 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 there's, there's two parts to it. The first one is accounting for what they've done in the last four years. Mm -hmm. And the second part is what they call, you know, consolidating their gains and then moving forward or, or and beyond. So a lot of the things they want to do in their second term, as far as health is concerned, it's not very revolutionary because a lot of it is a continuation of what they've been doing already. Any revolutionary thing, in my view, they, they wanted to do, they might have started or they've started already. And so it's just a continuation of, 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 of what they've started. So what they want to do is to focus on health promotion and prevention as part of primary health care through the National Health Insurance Scheme. Yesterday, we, we spoke a lot about National Health Insurance Scheme to achieve universal health coverage. We spoke about universal health coverage too. So, so that the essence of universal health coverage really is to ensure that um, everybody within a population, you know, everybody has access to health care. And yes, you can have access to health care, but that access <coughs> must not put you in a position that makes you worse off. Yeah. So, for example, you don't have to use all your savings to, to, to seek health care. When you do that, you get a health care, but that cannot qualify as universal health coverage. So, you know, you, you get health care, and when you're talking about universal health care or access to universal health care, a number of, you know, things come to play when you refer to access. So you have geographic access or geographical access, you have the physical access itself, mm -hmm. and you have what we call the financial access. A lot of the problems you have, of course, the problems you've had in Ghana regarding health care is cut across or has cut across or have cut across all these three areas I've mentioned. Physical, the structures themselves, mm -hmm. not really there as much as we want to have them. Geographic access, sometimes we hear that people have to travel several kilometers, pregnant women have to travel several kilometers sometimes in wheelbarrows before they get to health facilities. So that is a problem, you know. So the, the provision of ambulances, for example, helps in that access. Uh, construction of roads from the community centers to the health S um, facilities or health centers themselves, you know, is also part of that. I, when I mention health centers, I mention health cent centers mm -hmm. as uh, as a structure, a facility, because in the structure of health facilities in Ghana, the lowest is what we call the chips compound. We get to the health center, we get to the clinics, then the the hospital, district hospital, etc. So, I mean, th th that's how it, it works. So they want to focus on health promotion. And what's health promotion? A a a a way of uh, putting or making you put your health care and, and giving you control over your, your health and the outcomes you, you, you expect. So mm -hmm. a lot of that will come through advocacy, communication, etc., telling you that do this, don't do that. And a lot of the preventive things can also be, be, be woven around this. So they want to do so to, by focusing on health promotion and prevention as part of the primary health care through the NHIS to achieve universal health coverage. So okay. currently, the NHIS covers 
about 95% of our disease burden, including primary, secondary, and some tertiary care. In addition, children, the elderly, and other vulnerable groups do not pay premiums as well, yes. The missing link, they say, has been that the NHI does not cover health promotion and prevention, a critical aspect of reducing the disease burden and making the NHI financially sustainable. What, what they mean by this is that the NHI is essentially a curative care. Uh, the, the preventive part of health care is not covered by the NHIS. The preventive care part is dealt with by a different aspect of the Ministry of Health, for example. There's a preventive care office. But what they are saying is that they will incorporate health promotion and, and, and health preventive care into the health insurance scheme. And they are linking that to the financial viability of the scheme because yesterday we mentioned that when you are able to prevent diseases, I mean, the amount of money you spend in preventing the disease is not as much as the amount of money used in curing the disease. So, for example, if you detect the disease early, it, that, that's good as a form of primary prevention. When you, you, you detect it early, so you don't get it at all. Secondary prevention, when, you, when it happens to you and you detect it early, so it doesn't fester, that's also a, a kind of prevention. So, the more you put in resources to ensure that there is prevention, the, the, the more space, uh, you know, financially your uh, health financial institutions, uh, I mean, your health, like the health insurance scheme mm -hmm. will, will be. Health insurance okay. scheme, every time we've said they do not have a lot of money. Mm. If we're able to focus more on prevention, that will achieve two things. The population or the populace will be stronger because they will not be falling sick every now mm. and then. And number two, when they are not falling sick, then it means that the scheme is a bit freer. They do not have to spend a lot of money on curative care, on, on treatment, etc. So the scheme becomes okay. a bit freer. So that's what they are seeking okay. to do. Okay. Uh, just to continue quickly, they, they, they want to establish, okay, they said they have established wellness centers in Dodoa, Legon, and Tema hospitals as a first step. They also plan in the next four years to bring health promotion and prevention as part of primary health care under the NHIS, which will continue to be free for children, elderly, and the vulnerable groups. They want to review and overhaul health care financing with the aim of reducing the turnaround time for claims management to the barest minimum and also ensuring the sustainability of the NHI scheme. I think this is quite vague. If you want to reduce a turnaround time for claims management to the barest minimum, what, what does that mean? Where are we now and where do we want to go? And ensuring the financial sustainability of the NHI scheme. It's almost become like a cliche. Everybody talks about this, but we don't know exactly how they want to do that. That is missing from here. Okay. They want to deliver on the largest healthcare infrastructure investment by any government in the last 50 years by undertaking what they call the Agenda 111, previously Agenda 88, which they say will include the construction of 101 standard uh, design okay, so 100 we'll, we'll bed. We'll come to infrastructure. Okay, so right. I just wanted to pick your comments <coughs> okay. on the access, which okay. I think you've uh, uh, spoken about elaborately. So if we can, we can move to um, incentives. We can look at um, the healthcare workers, for example, <laughs> uh, you know, because we currently, we just saw a strike um, a few days back. It was just called off um, um, a few hours, uh, a few minutes, actually, to 12 o'clock today. So incentives is a big thing, whether it's salaries, whether we're giving them um, some incentives to encourage them to go to the rural areas and all that. It's a big thing for healthcare workers. From the two sides, what are we seeing in terms of um, incentives, in terms of salaries, and then we'll look at even employment because we have quite a huge discussion back and forth over employing uh, the, these uh, graduates when they come out of the various colleges and all that. So could you, if you can, what are we seeing with the two in terms of what they're <coughs> providing? Okay, so um, from the NDC manifesto uh, on page 63, they write that they will reward healthcare workers who accept postings to rural communities <coughs> and underserved areas with a five-year work abroad program. So they will reward healthcare workers who accept postings to rural communities and underserved areas with a five-year work abroad program. So that's one incentive that it's written there for health um, care workers. There's also the bit about employing the backlog of qualified health professionals. Mm -hmm. That's also one thing under capacity building for health. And they will support health professionals with insurance to cushion them from unintended consequences of their practice. That's another one. And there's the institution of a National Health Workers Day 
okay. and establish an award scheme for deserving individual workers and best facilities, including private sector facilities. That's also one. And they will support bilateral and other exchange programs for health workers to expose them to the best practices around the world. Ensure safety and protection of healthcare workers and patients. And they will set up the Professor Jacob Planjou Endowment Fund for mm -hmm. medical and surgical specialist training. And this is from the NDC. This is from the NDC. And then a plan to establish the Ghana College of Nurses and Midwives. You know, there is a College of Physicians and Surgeons, mm -hmm. and so they, they, they want something like this. And there is another interesting one. Implement tax waivers in order to assist health workers to acquire means of transport to respond to emergency calls. Okay. So that is one. Now, improve the skill mix, the numbers and distribution, and provide additional incentive packages for health professionals to work in underserved and unserved communities. And establish a housing scheme for health workers and provide residential facilities at all health facilities mm -hmm. for health workers. <laughs> at all health facilities for health workers. And then another thing is to scale up the training of physician assistants and emergency physicians. And there's one, um, let, me, let me pick the last one, which I, I develop strategies to reduce the cost of health care by promoting local production of this. This, this is not directly to the yeah, health, yeah, health, well, workers. Well, health workers. But for those in the medical laboratory space, mm -hmm. Establish a medical laboratory science council. So they also need a, a body that will, they will fall under. So okay. this is also mentioned so two bodies, by the NDC. They are looking at yeah. establishing two bodies, one for the lab guys and the other for the nurses and midwives. Yes. Okay. And then some tax waivers, some houses, To get cars, some cars housing, uh, housing all at all health facilities. But these, some of these, um, I mean, all the things they're saying are very, you know, lovely ideas. But practically, are these things that they can implement? Because housing, even cars during the COVID time, we had to, you know, um, say we wanted to give buses before uh, authorities in that space and the transport space also then decided that, oh, they were going to do it. But on a normal day, you wouldn't get that. So I don't know whether this is a realistic thing to do if you look at our circumstances. Sometimes when I see promises like this from the left and from the right, <laughs> the question, I, I try to link it to some other things. For example, during the COVID-19 era, nurses and healthcare workers who were supposed to go to work because churches and taxis had been grounded yeah. couldn't go to work. That's right. So we had to step in and say mm -hmm. we are providing buses before the Ministry of Transport yeah, came in and said they will do it. Before they stopped us from doing whatever I wanted to do for them to do what they did. Right. But the question is, if you have an effective public transport system, mm -hmm. would you need to give every single health worker a vehicle. Yeah. We are looking at 107,000 health workers as of 2017. Yeah. 107,000 health workers between 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. I'm sure we've added on and you're around 110,000 health workers. So give incentives for, even if you are going to do this for 30%, incentives for 30,000 health workers to own vehicles. Vehicles that will add on to what we have on our streets. Then you move from health workers and you may want to promise um, the, the security agencies. Then from the security agencies, you may want to promise teachers. Mm -hmm. But how about really working on the problem? So there's a question to be asked. Why do we need to give health workers cars? Because mm -hmm. they need to be able to move about in safer and efficient means of transport. Why, why don't we have it? Because we have not done this, 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 this. So how can we fix it? Then we fix the problem. Yes, right. So the problem is a transport issue, not a particularly giving health workers um, cars, right? So I think that as much as it sounds good, because we promise different worker groups these things, we should fix the fundamental things. I'm talking about housing at all the various um, health facilities. And if you look at uh, um, health facilities, the facts and figures, we have quite a lot of health facilities across the country. Mm -hmm. So housing at all the various health facilities, that's so a fantastic Kalibu, idea. Ridge, so it means that Ofanoche. if if this is anything to go mm -hmm. by, all workers of Kolebu will be housed in a in an estate around Kolebu. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. thirty-seven will be housed. Um, 
or not yeah. if, even if it's not around Kolebu, a Kolebu focused housing scheme will be available yes. for them. So we will do all these things for health workers, teachers, GRE staff, security agencies, the average Ghanaian. How is the housing policy capturing all, all of us to ensure that we all live in a safe and sound environment to be as productive as possible to pay taxes for national development to run? Mm -hmm. And consistently, and I'll always say this, the various governments that have led this country in the past 30 years that have lived on this earth as a Ghanaian have disappointed when it comes to housing. Rawlings did some, Kofor did some, Mills did some, Muhammad did some, mm -hmm. Kufado is trying to do some. And the work they've done on housing has not even solved 0.0001% of our housing challenge. Yeah. So we should not solve the problems in silos. Let's solve the problems in, in, in a whole. Housing is a problem for all Ghanaians. Let's deal with it. Because you are promising um, health workers today, tomorrow. When you go to Swami Magazine, okay, what promise are you going to give them to? You are, just, are you going to promise them only stuff related to their industry? Forgetting that beyond their industry, they are also human beings who need the Maslow's theory of needs yeah. to exist. So I think that our politicians and our parties should be thinking about the problems holistically, sustainably, not just to pick and choose. So we'll tell the nurses this to get votes. Mm -hmm. We'll tell these people this to get that. It doesn't work that way. We don't solve problems that way. Okay. So it's good. It sounds good in the ear, but I think that the general housing thing we failed, and we should, we should address that okay. before addressing these problems in silos. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a very important point yeah. um, could you make. So I think this promise is a two-in-one one. So for example, it says establish a housing scheme for health workers and provide residential facilities at all health facilities for health workers. So I think could you dealt with the first part of it, mm -hmm. which, which has to do with housing generally. So this one talks about, in my view, uh, health workers owning houses. Yeah. The second part of the promise talks about providing residential facilities at all health facilities for health workers. So this is not necessarily their private accommodation or, or homes they will own. It will have to do with the presence of health care workers at the premises of the facility, like the bungalow thing we talk about. So for example, when you go to Kolibu, a part of it, uh, you have the doctors and the nurses and other health workers you know, residing, and, and a lot of the other places. So I'm just wondering whether the the culture of this shouldn't have been put in a way that would suggest that they want to improve upon that, because it appears we already have a thing like that, because yeah. almost every big facility has, has some residential, residential yeah. you know, facility accommodation for staff. So I'm not quite sure what they really meant by this. To say to establish a housing scheme for health workers, that's understood, but to provide residential facilities at all health facilities for workers, health workers, I think it's a bit, unless of course they want to say that they will provide the residential facilities at health facilities which do not have these facilities. You, you get me? For yeah. example, if there's a, a big hospital which does Without not have residential, residential facilities, then you are saying you will provide them mm -hmm. this. But without that, I think it should have been maybe improving or maybe ensuring that you know you expand on the, the, the residential facilities at health uh, uh, at health facilities, mm -hmm. you know, to ensure that a lot more health workers live around the facility, so that any time there's an emergency and they are called, they will, they will be able to attend to, to to the patients in good time. Okay. Basically that. Now, you know I, why I want us to stay a bit longer with this uh, um, issue on incentives and sorting out um, 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 workers in the health sector is because every year, at least twice or three times there's a strike whether it's the doctors whether it's the nurses whether it's the physicians whether you know and the strike usually around the conditions of service from salary to housing to means of transfer to a lot of clothing things allowance. clothing allowance if you look at the nurses ones for example i think they were demanding over 18 or 15 things and we're told the government was only able to meet five or seven or there so. are nine main things they were asking for and six main ones mm. 
they've had an agreement on based yeah. on the information available. Mm -hmm. So every <clears throat> year we see them the back and forth, and every you know election year there's some you know talk around we're going to sort you out, but we fear, we appear to be finding it difficult to deal uh, with the issues. What should be the way forward with these um, incentives and sorting out uh, uh, health workers in, in our industry to be able to get what we expect from them as you know uh, workers? Well, I'll give you a very general answer, Vivian. Um, a, a number of things. <laughs> First of all, humans as we are, our needs, you know, we, we are insatiable. We, we, are, we are never satisfied with what we have. So it's important that, that a lot of these conditions of service, if really there are, will, will, will be reviewed every now and then. <coughs> so, so that's one part. The second part is that the the employer, which is government, must work to engender trust with these employees. The other part too is that the employees themselves must also, you know, they, they, they must not be unreasonable in the kinds of requests they make. Mm -hmm. This is important and it's related to the second, which has to do with the employer working to ensure there's trust because they think that there should be a time to strike or to hit so that the government or the employer is, is most affected. So, for example, lecturers always or often will go on strike when it's about, or when the academic year is about to start, or when they are about to write exams. That is where government will feel it most, so, so they do that. Now, we have a situation where we are in an election year. People know that around this time, just about three months to election, nurses are on strike. We are almost, I don't, I don't want to say we are at the tail end of, you know, fighting an, an, a, a, a pandemic, but we are in the midst of a pandemic and our nurses are saying that our nurses <coughs> you know uh, uh, suspended services that's a, such a critical time in two ways election year and in the midst of a pandemic very you know good timing to hit government and to have you know some of the answers or some of the, the, the your requests met so I think that government generally must create a certain environment that will ensure that when you tell the people this you ensure that you do it the time you tell them you do it Oftentimes, they are, when, they are, when they go on strike, they are told that, okay, you get back to work, give us a roadmap, and we'll ensure that we will meet you, you know, halfway or something. They give the roadmap, and government reneges on its part of the, yeah. of, of the deal, and that raises a lot of issues. So it's important that government will also meet its part of it. The other point I want to make is that in the public sector, <laughs> if you don't agitate, nobody really listens to you. Mm. That is why they keep doing this. In the private sector, employers can sit and say, okay, um, these guys are working hard, let's increase our salary yeah. by this percentage. In large groups like this in the public sector, it's quite difficult for government to institute, you know, um, a regime where, let's say, after every period, this is given to you, that is given to you. So because that system is not so efficient, it forces the people, it makes the people always go on strike or, you know, threaten to embark on industrial actions because that is what will make our government listen to them. So now that they've done this and government has is, is, is come to listen to them and made some concessions, now they have benefited some way, some, somewhat. We don't know when this will happen again, maybe the next year, next two years. If government is not delivering or they feel that the other needs have arisen, they're speaking to government, government is not listening, then they will do a thing like this. So yesterday I saw on CNR, a lot of the hospitals were almost mm -hmm. empty. There was mm -hmm. a guy who, who had to... Who, who wanted to dress his wound? Yeah. He was given yesterday to come. He went, there was nobody. You know, you don't want these things. And around this time, and health is emotive. Around this time, when somebody goes to the hospital and, for example, somebody dies, they blame government for yeah. it. And government is in an election year. Government wants to, re to, to be returned to power. And government will not want these situations to be happen happening. So government is at a vulnerable stage or a vulnerable so stage. <laughs> and people will hit it so hard, and government will yield. Okay, so well, let's look at employment. But, but Vida, yeah, I want you. to add something to this. You see, the, the thing with Ghana is that, and, and it's something I've been thinking about, I think that in Ghana, workers are not treated fairly. Mm. It cuts across a lot of the um, um, industries. So you see a lot of people in certain jobs or certain industries, and when they rise up a little bit, they run away especially when they acquire extra knowledge and extra experience. Yeah. They run away to go and do other things. So we are only unable to retain a lot of the experience hands in a lot of the things that we do. We can start from journalism 
to manufacturing, to a lot of things, even football. In football, our stars will not stay here because the industry is not getting a lot of money and we are not paying fair wages yeah. to our footballers. Everybody in this country wants to go out there to get fairer conditions of service or get fairer pays. That's, that's the norm in this country. And it's something that we need to look at as a country. Because <clears throat> you bring in some of the best brains. We say that we have a lot of Ghanaians outside the country who are smart, who can help us fix problems. But the moment they get into this country, hmm. they don't even get conditions of any proper conditions of service. They look at it and they go back. Yeah. And the people we have in this country who have worked and gained experience in the system, when they add a bit of value and there's an opportunity, they really? move out. Yeah. So we are not retaining the best of our human resources and the best of our brains. And it's something the country must work but on. But can we afford the, the, the figures that, you know, you, you would expect in a typical sector? For example, it, it appears because when you <coughs> even listen to the negotiations, if you, even if you look at our budget, wages takes majority mm -hmm. of the money we yeah. look for. Right, mm -hmm. and the the, li the little that is left is not able to do much. If you compare that to the revenue we make, I mean, it, it doesn't add up. Is it that we cannot really, truthfully afford it, or we are not being managing the issue properly? Ghana is a small country with a lot of big resources. Mm -hmm. For a country of 31 million people, okay, and the resources at our disposal, and the opportunities that we have, Ghana is one of the few countries that doesn't really lack anything. Hmm great climate, hmm. a lot of water resources, 5 billion gallons of water flowing on the surface of uh, our country every year. We have forestry resources, mineral resources, human resources. We have everything. It's the mismanagement of our economy and the various sectors that has got us here. But if we really sat down to manage things properly and try to create value from everything, the average Ghanaian must earn something better from what they do. Look at Agric. We say Agric is the mainstay of our economy. How much does the average person in a Greek earn? Because we've sat down to be a production um, industry. We just produce, produce, produce. And somebody in Switzerland who doesn't even know how cocoa is planted earns more from the cocoa than your cocoa <laughs> farmers in the farms. So mm -hmm. we need to look. And, and, and it's not like we don't know these things. We know all these things. So we need to look at the resources we have. We need to re-strategize. We need to think about creating more value from everything that we have. Look at the Volta Lake. Yeah. The biggest man-made lake as at the time was done. That is billions, trillions of dollars sitting there. Opportunities mm -hmm. for a lot of things. Look at the Volta region. Tourism. Look at agric resources. Look, just look at creative arts and culture. Okay? I'm not even mentioning gold, diamond, bauxite, all the things that we have. Our unique position as the center of the world and how aviation maritime transit and everything, we are in a very good position to maximize the returns. We've not maximized the returns in anything. Mm -hmm. So we're in a country where if you want to feed your students, you go and borrow money. You want to take care of maternal health, you go and borrow money or you get donor funding. When the donors say we are not giving you money, then you're in trouble. You want to work on HIV AIDS. Hmm. HIV AIDS. If the global fund says we don't have money, your government does not have money to put into HIV AIDS pre prevention. And it's not like we are not resourced. We are better resourced than a lot of countries doing better than us. So the question is, can we do it? Yes, we can do it. We need our leaders to sit up. And we need Ghanaians also to sit up okay. and put their shoulders to the wheel. Then we can create the value to, look, the average Ghanaian architect or the average Ghanaian, um, let's even use doctors. The last time I saw my friend's pay slip as a doctor, I was surprised <laughs> that you've gone to school for six, seven years. You finished and you went, you've gone to specialize. When I saw his pace, I was like, eh? So why are you in Ghana? Yeah. You understand? But I feel the country can support a system where we pay fair wages and, and, and retain our best brains. Because another example, people move from this country to India and South Africa for health care. And when you move from here to those countries, you don't pay $1,000 for health care. You pay $100,000, $150,000, $50,000, $40,000. They get money for that, and two, they get more experience. Because their practitioners get to work on patients with different problems, and they get more experience. Cancer treatment in Ghana, we are doing well, but not there. Mm -hmm. Lots of, if we invested in the right things, we retain the people, get experienced hands to attract people to come here for medical tourism, 
okay. get experience and who are paid better to serve their country and all in all Ghana will benefit so we do have the resources nobody can tell me Ghana doesn't have the resources to pay its human resources well and to keep them happy to work for the country okay v very <coughs> interesting points so you see do we have the resources can we afford it was a question we, we, we can I mean let's put in efficiency I only, only deal with it from the efficiency mm. side of things how many people are on the government payroll less than 700,000 people yeah and if you look at if you look at the, the, the annual budget allocation for emoluments of people on the public payroll that's that's huge efficiency but when you go into the public sector typically there are things that one person can just do in a private institution mm -hmm. but you find five six seven people doing the same job getting getting paid various sums of money yeah and because there's very little to do because there are many people on the same thing they have too much time on their hands so you go you find that if you find them watching movies you, you find them going to town they just come and sign and, and and leave the office go to town go do whatever they are doing come back in the evening come and sign and that's it they've got to come to work in the end government loses so when you compare what government invests or government puts in to what governments get in return in terms of productivity i mean that that's that, that quite a, a mismatch so in order to deal with some of these things let's look at the issue of efficiency let's put uh, round pegs in round holes. No okay. more square pegs in round holes. Let's get the most, the more qu the qualified people to to, to 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 do their jobs. Expenditure. When you go into the government sector or the public sector, a lot of things people don't care about or think about before they do. You know, because it, it is not their private business. Mm -hmm. A lot of the things people do in the private public sector, the kind of people they employ and the kind of expenditures they make, they will never ever dare to make some of these decisions if they're running their private businesses. So I think we need a change of mentality that will make us approach government business like our own business. Also, where does the money go? Nurses are paid. I had a nurse's salary the last time. I was very surprised. <laughs> very, very small amount of money. Very small. And, and, and a lot of people. These people always go on strike. Doctors will go on strike. Teachers will go on strike. Nurses will go on strike. Mm. You know, and it is a perennial problem. Indeed, that was the reason why you know, Mahama made a famous statement about the dead, dead goat syndrome. Mm -hmm. He was talking about election year and strikes, etc. And he was trying to say that he was now used to strikes, yeah. and so he had become like a dead goat. You know, and that statement, I, I think, still, still, still hunts more <laughs> about goat. It's because of things like this. So now let's look at what actually takes the money: transportation. Could you talk about good transportation system, public transport system? If, if, if the transportation system or public transport system is good, a lot of people will not be so concerned about owning their own means of transport necessarily. You hop on a public transport or a public bus, takes you to wherever you are going at, 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 a, fair, at a fair price, and, and you are fine. Mm -hmm. um, food. We have a lot of food locked up in the, in the rural areas because they don't have the means of bringing those foods to, to, to the urban centers. Um, school fees hospital bills if you're able to deal with our health sector well health insurance works properly maybe free uh, um, primary health care works properly a lot of the money we spend on these things would be left in our pocket and we can have money to do other things so i think it, it's you know you can't deal with this in isolation you deal with it together with other aspects of our society fix public transportation so people will spend you know a uh, 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 lower amount of money on transportation fix uh, uh, the agric system so that we have enough food in the system people don't have to pay a lot of money to get food you know uh, uh, school fees okay. hospitals etc when all these are done and you pay the people some amount of money some money can be left in their pocket and they can do other things with it otherwise you pay them you give them 50 percent 50 percent increase a lot of money but if you give the person 50 percent increase today other economic factors will eat away these increases and next year they are back to point zero so they will demonstrate or they will go on strike again. And government okay. continues in, in, in this, you know, cycle, which becomes vicious. Okay. There are a lot of messages from you guys. So I'm going to read them in a bit. But we'll take a, a quick break. When we come back, we'll look at employment. We'll look at infrastructure and other issues uh, around policy that the two major political parties are proposing on health. You can send a message um, via Facebook or WhatsApp uh, or Twitter. Facebook and Twitter, remember to add the hashtag Voters Diary and send your message. And if you want to send a message via WhatsApp, the numbers are currently on your screen. We'll be right back.
gonna make most of it. It's a beautiful day, yeah. a day to share with you. You'll make my world go right. Bring home happiness. So yeah, welcome back to The Voters Diary. My name is Vivian Kai. Look, I'm here with Kojo Akotobwating as well as Selom Adonu. You can join the conversation. We want it to be as interactive as possible. Just send a message uh, via Facebook or Twitter at the hashtag Voters Diary or send us a message via WhatsApp on the numbers on your screen. Let me read some of the messages you sent. Maxwell from Kumasi says, realistically, the salaries of some Article 71 holders must be slashed to build more health facilities in the country, you say. This one from Eric Asinfosu says, Good afternoon, Vivian. Politicians are eager to implement policies that will benefit a section of people, forgetting the people who will execute their promises. I tell you, when they win, they will not work with what they have promised the workers. They are lucky the teachers are, all, are not in school, you say. Emmanuel from Takradi says, Good afternoon, wonderful submissions. It does appear as if our leaders are just providing lip uh, service approach to most critical issues in the system without any proper blueprint. That's why we're still where we are after all these years. And then uh, Eric from Kokrobite says, hello Vivian, this strike has caused a lot and continue to cause a lot. My uncle died this afternoon at Kolebu because there was no nurse around him when he was about to go for his uh, dialysis treatment. Oh, that's that's sad, Eric. Sorry about that. So, guys, the, the impact of the strike, uh, uh, we can see people losing their relatives over, over that, you know. Employment is also a big thing. We have, um, we've seen a lot of agitations over uh, people graduating from various um, health colleges, among others. They are not getting access to um, work in various health facilities. Both governments have been hit by these strikes or agitations. Are we seeing anything positive on that front with both of the uh, major political parties? Well, the NDC says they will employ the backlog of qualified health professionals. That is point one and uh, point A, under capacity building for health. Okay. Straight, straightforward, they will employ the backlog of qualified health professionals and also um, the bit about people who go to underserved areas, they will give them special incentives like five years the five year exchange program abroad and related matters. So on employment, that's um, what the NDC says in their manifesto for health. Oh, okay. Do we? Uh, does the yes, NPP uh, have any? Well, the, the NPP, like I said, the NPP is in government. So uh, a lot of the things they want to do in the next term is a continuation of of of, of what they've been doing. And so what they've done is to give us an account of the number of people they've, they've, they've employed in the period. And even within a two-month period when COVID-19 was hitting us so hard, mm -hmm. they said that they've granted financial clearance to employ additional 24,285 health professionals between March and, and June, about three or four months, to help fight the pandemic. And they, they detailed this as, 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 as consisting of um, 8,086 nurse assistants, clinical and preventive, 5,786 mm. diploma nurses and midwives, 326 newly inducted house officers, and then 10,097 graduate nurses and midwives, both uh, from public institutions and then uh, private institutions, public and private institutions. So uh, they may not, you know, now I'm speaking generally, they may not have given certain numbers of people they want to employ. But when you look at the promises they are making, infrastructure, expanding healthcare, 
etc. When you build more facilities, it means mm -hmm. that you're going to employ more healthcare workers. So MPP is promising to build 111 um, health health facilities, Agenda 111. Yeah. These 111 facilities will be um, manned by 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 professionals. professionals so it yeah. means that that will be job creation for people. Yeah. NDC has also spoken about building a number of regional hospitals, etc. When of course this was just named Agenda 111, but look at the NDC manifesto. They almost capture it in a different manner, but the substance really is the same. So when all these things are done, that will be opportunity for, 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 for people to be employed. I think the matter about the nurses, so NDC says that they will employ the backlog of, 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 of nurses and, 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 and healthcare workers, so employ the backlog of qualified health professionals. A lot of these health professionals obviously are, are, are nurses. I think that we need to be getting to a point where this thing about bonding, the nurses bonding, etc., should become a thing of the past because it is becoming obvious that government doesn't have the bandwidth to employ all these people. Oh, so it doesn't really make sense that you are encouraging the private sector to grow, but nurses finish school, complete school, professional, I mean, they are professionals, they've gone through their training, and they are only waiting for government to employ them. When the private sector, which is expanding, can employ them and they, they will start working. Mm -hmm. I, I think that of course, I've heard the health minister say before that they, they were considering or they were going to, you know, uh, abandon that system. I think they have to do that quickly because it doesn't make sense. You don't mm -hmm. have the bandwidth, and you can't also you will not also allow others to employ them because of a certain policy. I don't think it, 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 it makes sense at all. Okay. So yes. All right. Okay. Let me take uh, um, on, some on more um, um, employment, um, if you would messages. permit me to, okay, to, you... to just chip this in. I'm looking at the. Ghana Health Service facts and figures mm -hmm. for published in 2018. And I'm looking at the distribution of health professionals by region 2017. Okay. And it's an interesting number which is hitting me. 664 stenographers. 664 stenographers. I, I am not a healthcare worker. Then Selom, you have Selim, an idea the of, of, well, of the healthcare system. What do stenographers <laughs> what do, do, do in our healthcare system? I, I, I don't know what they do in the, in the health system, but what, what I can say is the, the st what, what stenographers will do in the, in the health system will not be different from what stenographers will do anywhere. I, I think what has happened over the period is that, uh, again, we're going back to the issue about the public sector, you know, malaise or the way people behave in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the public sector. So, there, there are things that people, certain people like a stenographer. Well, what is he doing there? I, 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 it's just like city. You, you have stenographers here. What should ordinarily happen is that those people must be given the opportunity to upgrade. In this era of computers, etc., you know, you have even people who are typists in the system. Mm -hmm. You need to give opportunity or provide opportunity for some of these people to improve. If they cannot improve. They, they must find their, their way out, just like it will be in a private institution. And this is one look at them. A lot of them are even nearing their retirement age. So if you tell them to go home, <laughs> I mean, really, yeah, a lot of them, a, a lot of them will, will we, not have any, we need, anything. We need, if you look at the wage bill for the health service, <laughs> yeah. it's big. It's huge. We need more money to employ more people to be in the various facilities. Mm -hmm. And here we are with 664 stenographs. I don't know the job they do. Exactly, yeah, we, 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 but, 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 so but, if anybody is watching but, they but, know, but truth is, they can feel us the, 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 the stenograph is, like, is, like is, like is, is like a typist. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like a tra transcribing things. Unless they do something else. But <laughs> knowing what a stenographer <laughs> does, if you have 664 of them on your payroll, I think that's a lot. Yeah. And so, if, 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 if Maybe we are they serious have additional about... rules. I don't know. So, you see, these are the people who, <laughs> who watch movies wondering. and things in the office. And a lot of them are Mibahache, are MBAs. <laughs> you dare not touch them because they know the system. You know, I, I think the, the best way to do this is to provide them opportunities to improve. Okay. Give them time, like what the universities did or are doing, you just started doing when this whole policy about you having a PhD before you teach, etc., started coming up. So they gave everybody who didn't have a PhD X number of years. Within this, or by this time, if you don't get your PhD, it means you're on your way out or you, 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 oh. you cannot be a lecturer. So because they, they had a target and because they knew how serious it was, the universities provided opportunities and they took advantage of those opportunities. That's why a lot of them have become PhD holders now. Okay. I think that is the approach 
our public sector institutions must be using. If you cannot dispense, if you cannot let the person go, find a way of improving the person or find a way of giving the person another job to do. But keeping stenographers on your on your on your HR list, I I I, I don't know what they will be doing there because the stenograph the, the, the work stenographer has not been qualified by anything. A stenographer okay. is a stenographer. Yeah. And stenographers we know have very little to do in today's world where healthcare delivery is more sophisticated than before. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many stenographers are in the private sector, the yeah. private health sector. Yeah. So when we're able to look at, to see, or, or to, 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 to check the number of stenographers in the private sector, and we have this in the public sector, I think that, will, can, that, yeah. that, 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 that so will help we'll, we'll us see that exactly what then. they do. But I doubt <laughs> if there's any stenographer in any serious private healthcare institution in this country. Okay, so we'll, we'll look into that. But let me take a few questions. Well, our next one will be infrastructure. Then we'll wrap up with the positives in the in the manifesto, and then we, we close. So, um, uh, dude from Tumu says, in fact, um, you guys are very good. I like your analysis. Um, Safo Kantanka from Akuse says, I totally agree with your panelists on their submissions because high amount of us, most of our salaries go into rent, transportation, and food. So government should tackle the problems in a holistic manner. Okay, Philip from Teshima says, good afternoon, Vivian and your guests. It is very painful. Um, sorry, good afternoon. I think we shouldn't just be discussing their manifestos, but their competences and their track of records. So this is uh, Amwa Philip from Teshima. We'll do that tomorrow actually we'll look at the real uh, issues what either did uh, and all that and then we have um Another one, it says, good afternoon, Vivian, and your guests. It is very painful and disgusting that ministers, MPs, and other institutions of government receive better salaries and still enjoy free things like car fuel, accommodation, water, electricity, just to mention a few. Meanwhile, public sector workers who receive meager salaries still have to pay for water, electricity, and uh, rent with their meager salaries, you say. And then the um, uh, hashtag voters diary came from Sredu says, your discussion is very informative. We truly have more than enough for a small country like Ghana. The politicians say nice things, but when power is won, do little, which doesn't correspond to even a half of the amount of money they got at their disposal in budgetary terms. At the end, many people continue to suffer with just few of us uh, Few of them in the top part, uh, in the party benefits. And then this one, Ibrahim from Tamale says, Good evening, Vivian, and your panel. The problems we are battling are not the making of the politicians alone, but we Ghanaians as a whole. All the stories we are telling will not help us until we get a natural development plan. In, I think it should be national. national development plan in place, you say. Okay, so this this is what people are saying. Guys, infrastructure, then we'll look at some of the uh, positives and then we'll wrap up. I think with infrastructure, the main thing is Agenda 111 for mm -hmm. both of them. Okay. Because if you count the facilities each party wants to do, they're all looking at almost the same amount, Agenda 111. So district hospitals for all the districts without uh, district hospitals, um, regional hospitals for the new, the, the six new regions, the NDC says they are going to upgrade all regional hospitals into teaching hospitals. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a bit of the difference here. But, but, but that, that, yeah. that's quite an interesting one too, because in, in the structure in, in, in our health, in, in, in the structure of our health care system, so we have primary health care facilities, we have secondary, and we have tertiary. Mm -hmm. You know, so to move regional hospitals, which are secondary health facilities, you know, to tertiary, what then happens to the secondary belt? You know, okay. I, I don't know how that is, is, is really going to work. And so it doesn't mean that we won't have a secondary health facility anymore, or the tertiary health facilities will now be combining the tertiary role with the secondary role. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't quite get that. I, I hope that which, I didn't. Which, which has been happening anyway, because you know, Kolebu well, almost does that's all a, those everything. things. But you see, okay. there, there's a policy about, uh, we call it a gatekeeper system, where uh, so at the various levels, there is an attempt to discourage people from moving to the next level without a referral, you know. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, I have a simple cut and I take a car and go all the way to Kolibu, when a chips compound in my area could just quickly fix that for me, what I do is I congest the, the Kolibu place and I don't leave them to do the, the, the job they are supposed to be doing as a tertiary institution. And because it's a tertiary institution, it's also 
more expensive to treat that simple thing that the, the chips compound, for example, or the, the health center could, 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 could just treat at, at a lower fee. And because a lot of these are paid by government, it bloats government's bill unnecessarily. So, for example, if they can suture or they can just take care of a cut for you at the health center and it costs, let's say, 10 CDs, I mean, I'm just giving an example, 10 CDs, you go to Kolibu, because of the caliber of the systems they use and the people there, it may cost about 20 CDs, but it's the same result you get. And government will then have to pay double of the 10 CDs you should have paid at a lower level, at the mm -hmm. upper level. But, and, but and I, I, I see these two um, promises from the parties as fantastic promises. Mm -hmm. okay. For me, if every district um, gets a district hospital, the quality that we've seen, uh, using Dodoa as an example, as a reference point, or the Ga East, or the Wa one as a, as a reference point, then we are going to improve access for people across the country. Mm -hmm. You understand? And I feel that those district hospitals, the quality I've seen so far suggests that they could even step in for the um, regional hospitals should we upgrade them to tertiary institutions. Okay. The other thing also is that we do not have enough training facilities to train more doctors in the system. Okay. You have Cape Coast Teaching Hospital, you have Confanoche, you have Kolebu, UHAS. you have Tamale, and then you have UHAS. And if we have all the regional hospitals being district hospitals, we will, we will be remove, being tertiary hospitals, we remove the need for people to be moving from their regions to get to, to these, places. these places. Number two, there is the element of doctors wanting to move to Accra, Ho, Cape Coast, or Tamale because they want to move higher. So, so if we have tertiary hospitals in the, in the regions, there will be facilities closer to doctors to feed their aspiration of learning to improve. And these facilities will help us train more people. The only problem I have is the fact that Whilst we attempt to do this, we should not do it and approach it like we've approached a lot of the health infrastructure. For example, we fixed UGMC. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't have a proper plan to resource UGMC with staff. So as, yeah. we, as we speak, yeah. UGMC yeah. is not fully yeah. operational. Yeah. We opened the WAH hospital. Hmm. We, we didn't have a proper plan to resource it with staff. So as we aspire to upgrade them into tertiary facilities, must have a well thought through strategy mm -hmm. to equip these hospitals one with staff and the equipment they need and the NPP writes something interesting in their manifesto which I think is fantastic they write that in the next NPP government we shall implement a national equipment leasing policy mm -hmm. covering medical equipment vehicles photocopiers printers scanners among others as part of the measures to manage more efficiently our capital expenditure budget and it's true look when you build a facility equipment cost a loan if you are buying them at a go, may, 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 may prevent you from operationalizing them. But if there is an equipment leasing policy where you lease them and the um, company you are taking them from would be, will be um, taking care of them, replacing broken ones and all these things, I believe we'll have our facilities at an optimal performance state most, uh, most of the time. So, in, in it, serious private yeah. uh, um, Companies, companies lease equipment. These days, yeah. don't even buy photocopies. Yeah. Yeah. They just yeah. lease them. There's a problem. They call the company yeah. to come and fix it. To come and fix or replace. You know, you know, so, yeah. that, so, that, that's so the I way think to the, really NP N the NPP's equipment leasing policy, I like it. Okay. I think it's smart. The NPP already says they are paying for um, specialist training. The NDC says when they come, they will expand specialist training. I think it's also smart because you cannot have tertiary hospitals across the country without having the specialists to man them. Yeah. So. Uh, on this call, Agenda 111 for both parties, my only question is, where are you going to get over $2 billion mm -hmm. to fund, to fund these thing. facilities? It's, it's only prudent for the parties to come and give us a picture of how they are going to raise the funding to do some of these things okay. so that we will know that it's a promise that can be achieved. Okay. All right, so so, so the, the <coughs> building of the facilities, now popularly you know, called Agenda 111, I, I, I think... so. All these we are told should happen in four years because mm -hmm. it's a four-year mandate. So when you build all these facilities, you know, 111 facilities, we just spoke about training of health professionals, etc. We need to deepen that connection between the training of health, health professionals and the establishment or the building of these facilities. So we have doctors. Is there any, any, any plan that is, you know, very... Uh, should I say believable okay. that will churn out doctors, more doctors in the next four years, for example. 
churn out more specialists for these 111 facilities in the next four years, for example, nurses, etc. I think we, we need to interrogate the link between the training of health professionals and the building of these facilities because we don't want a situation where, and indeed, the building of facilities to the politician you know, provides a lot of opportunities to do many things. We don't want a situation where they will be in a hurry yeah. to build the facilities for, for certain reasons and the facilities will now become empty shells and, and we cannot really you know, maximize the benefit we can get from them because okay. the people to man those facilities are not there. Okay. And we so also don't, some, give somebody, me a, a, yeah. a quick, uh, we also yeah. don't want them to handle these facilities the way they handle the Eurojet project. Mm -hmm. okay. Where you sign a contract in 2008, yeah. project should be yeah. done in four years, yeah. project yeah. not done, government yeah. is paying for projects that have not been completed. Hmm. And we, we don't want that mismanagement want of that, the space we? because we don't have money anyway. Okay. A man of Alcoverida responding to your stenographic uh, comment says, mm -hmm. stenographers are typist stroke shorthand, but are secretaries and administrators. In fact, they were the first who were easily trained to work with computers when it emerged. The name is there, but they, are all manner, they do all manner of administrative work, filing um, data, etc., in the hospital. So they must not be looked down upon, Emmanuel. No, I, I, I don't think we are, we are looking so down upon them. I think it's a reaction to... I think it's explain what they do. So you say they are the more the administration, administrative, administrative side in but the admi hospital. An, an administrator is not necessarily a stenographer. Well, he is so okay. Let me not say <laughs> no, that. So, 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 so the health, that the health, the health <laughs> service is saying that they came in as stenographers, but, but they are but not doing that anymore. The health service has 2,600 accounts and finance officers, yes. 1,100 administrators. Uh -huh. We have 1,237 <laughs> biostatisticians. <laughs> And these are the people who are putting in data. Okay. So you, the data entry better. person is so, even from a stenographer. Okay, okay, guys. Let's leave this stenographer <laughs> thing. All right, we'll get more information okay. on this one. Um, says um, Dominic from Tamale. Good day, Vivian and your team. Um, thank you for a very well-informed discussion. I think a Ghanaian public worker does not need any additional incentives. Like a difficult attitude to work among others will cause you to cry for Mother Ghana. For the politicians, remunerations, the least I talk about it, the better. Until as a nation we develop a total metaphorsis in uh, mindset and attitude to enhance our own dignity and future as a nation, we will continue to be fooled by our leaders and then we will be stagnant as a developing country Till the world ends, Dominic, you say. There's still a lot of messages coming. I can't take them. But thank you very much for sending your messages. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be looking at the real situation on the ground. So we'll be going across the country from the northern all the way to the greater Accra region, looking at the projects, the policies being implemented in terms of health. So wherever you are, you can send us a message, um, whether it has to do with infrastructure or healthcare delivery in your regions. And um, I have been doing this today with Salom Adonu. He heads our articles and featured decks here at City FM and City TV, as well as Kojo Akotobwati, head of new media here at City FM and City TV. Salom, Kojo, when we are ending, he looks at me, uh, you know, in a way like, uh, oh, 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 we, oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Kojo, we finished. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Vivid Kai Loko. See you again tomorrow.